Page Speed 101, Episode 5. In the last video, we talked about the basics of web caching, what it is, its advantages, and the different types of web caches. Basically, we covered the what and the why. In this one, we'll be going over the how, covering topics like caching headers, directives, freshness, and validation. In the first episode on caching, we mentioned HTTP requests and responses, which clients and servers use to exchange resources. Besides resources, these requests and responses also carry additional information in the form of HTTP headers. Response headers in particular allow us to control most of the caching process. You can see the HTTP headers for any request with your browser's developer tools. Just open the page, right-click, select Inspect, and click on Network. After that, refresh the page and click on a request to see its headers. In terms of caching, there are two important headers we should note here, the expires header and the cache control header. The expires header is pretty straightforward. It tells the web cache how long the representation or response should be considered fresh. As you can see, this header contains only a date, making it easy to configure, but pretty inflexible. Nowadays, the expires header is mostly used as a fallback to the cache control header. You can use cache control to set a ton of different rules called directives. These directives allow you to configure your caching policy in much more detail. No store directive instructs web caches not to store any version of the resource under any circumstances. The max age rule sets the maximum amount of time that the cache can keep the saved resource before re-downloading it or revalidating it with the origin server. It takes its value in seconds. For example, cache-control colon max-age equals 60 tells the web cache that the resource must be considered fresh for one minute from the time of the request. After that, the content is marked as stale. The public directive says that the response may be stored on any cache. Conversely, using the private rule leads to the resource only being saved in browser caches. Again, there are lots of other directives which won't go into here. For a complete list, check out Mozilla's website via the links in the description. What's important to remember for now is that setting the correct response headers on your server is the most important part of building a good caching policy. Now, let's talk about freshness and validation. Let's say that the max age directive for a representation is set to 60 seconds. What happens during and after those 60 seconds? Well, during this time frame, the representation is considered fresh. The web cache can serve it without contacting the origin server. After the minute is up, the content is marked as stale. In most cases, caches can't serve stale content. Typically, they have to contact the origin server and re-download the response. But there's a problem with this process. You don't want to re-download resources that haven't changed since the last time they were saved. That's unnecessary overhead for your origin server, as well as a waste of time and bandwidth. This is where validation comes in. First, the web cache receives a request for a stale resource. The web cache then clicks when the resource was last modified and asks the origin server if it has been changed since then. The origin server checks the resource and sends a response. If the original hasn't been changed, the web cache serves its representation without re-downloading the resource. If it has been changed, the origin server needs to send the updated version, which is then saved on the web cache. The benefit here is that we avoid unnecessary file transfers and ensure that visitors always see up-to-date content. There are two ways to set this up. The first one is to use the last modified and if modified since headers. The second option is to use an e-tag validator. Most modern web servers use both validation methods automatically for static resources. For a deeper dive into revalidation and conditional requests, check out the link in the description to the 2020 Web Almanac. The request response model with caching layers. We now have a pretty good understanding of the what, why, and how behind web caching. So, we have a visitor who types a website URL in his browser. Without caching, this request needs to go all the way to the origin server, which in turn must process it and send a response. Now, let's add browser, CDN, and server-side caching to the mix. 
When we do that, the first thing the client does is to check whether the requested page can be served from the browser cache. If it can't, the request goes out to the network where the CDN checks whether it can fulfill it from its own cache. If the CDN also doesn't have the resource, it goes to the origin server, which checks in its cache. Only if it can't get the resource from its cache does it build a new response. As you can see, there are many situations in which the request may never reach the origin server. And even when it does, the subsequent response can usually be cached on the server itself and on the other web caching layers for future requests. You can set up this whole process by configuring your server's response headers and working with a CDN provider. There are links in the description for more advanced resources if you want to go that route. On the other hand, you can also use a service like NitroPack to take care of the entire process for you. Whatever you decide, setting up a good caching policy should be a priority for any website owner. In the following episode, we'll talk more about CDNs, including what they are, their benefits, popular providers, and more. See you in the next one.